So I love watching cooking shows, which is weird because I can't cook. Uh, I'm a terrible cook. In fact, I sent this picture to my wife on Thursday. And I sent her that, and I said, the potato in the pantries are growing fingers. <laughs> is that a bad thing? <laughs> like I said, I, I can't cook. I sent this picture to her. We're supposed to make mashed potatoes. And I was like, is that a thing? Like, is this okay? Uh, and so even though I can't, you can take that down. That's super disturbing. You guys are wondering what happens in our house. I don't know. We moved. It ended up in a pantry. It grew legs and ran away. Um, but, you know, even though I don't know how to cook and I'm, I'm pretty terrible at it, I love cooking shows. Also, for those of you who are concerned that we made mashed potatoes out of those potatoes, we didn't. <laughs> we went out and bought new ones. Those were like super soft. It was weird. Uh, but I, I, love, I love to watch shows about cooking. I love Top Chef. I love Chopped, Cutthroat Kitchen. I'll even watch shows where Gordon Ramsay screams at people for an hour because I love watching cooking shows. And lately, my wife and I have been binge-watching the 72 seasons of Chopped that are currently on Hulu. Uh, and the reason why we do it is because it's mindless, right? You can jump right in. There's no plot. You know, you don't have to follow along. Uh, we've, we've got a, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and so it's like we can't get hooked into Stranger Things because it would take like nine months for us to watch it. So we watch Chopped. And one of my favorite things about cooking shows are, are those episodes that are about redemption, I love watching people who previously lost in heartbreaking fashion get a second chance to prove that they're capable of winning, to prove that the last time that they competed and lost wasn't indicative of who they were as a chef. But the problem with these episodes is that only one chef actually gets redemption because only one can win. Everyone else on the redemption episode still loses. And most of them end up doing worse than they did the time before. This week we were watching a redemption episode of Chopped, and all four of the chefs in the competition had finished in second place in crushing fashion. And so all of them came back to redeem themselves. And because it's Chopped Redemption, that meant the basket items were completely ridiculous. And so inside the basket were pig snouts, fava beans, children's teething biscuits, strawberry daiquiri jam. Now, some of you are already thinking about, like, what you could cook, and that means you watch too much Chopped, okay? I know that feeling. Every time we go to the grocery store, if we had four items, what could we make? I, nothing. I, have, I could not make anything. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's a harder episode, and so this episode begins, and you're watching these people, and, and they're kind of sharing their story about why they're back and, and what they hope to do. And, and the whole entire time this is happening, three of the chefs are just crushing it. Like, you, you see what they do, and you're like, oh, my gosh, like, you're a genius. I never would have thought of that. But there's this fourth guy named Gilbert, and Gilbert looks completely lost. He can't figure out what to do with the food. He can't figure out even what the teething biscuits are, and so he's like crunching them up, and he's tasting a bunch of things, and, and you can just tell the entire time that he's lost, and so you watch the whole first third of the episode, and you're watching it going, this is a train wreck. You realize from the start, Gilbert's not going to make it. You know, the episode begins, and you realize he's going to be the first one chopped. And so time ends, and he puts the dish down, and it looks like wet dog food. It's disgusting. Uh, and eventually the camera cuts to the judges eating it, and they start complimenting him as a person, which is how you know he's not going to make it. They're like, you seem like a good dad, <laughs> like while they eat the food. And so, it, you know, it's terrible. It's, it's a train wreck, and you watch this thing, and eventually he ends up getting chopped, and he has that long walk down that chopped hallway, right? The camera follows you the whole way. And the whole time he's talking about how badly he wanted to win, and how much loss hurt because he wanted to show his newborn son that he was capable. In a teen redemption episode a few years ago, a student who finished second in an entire teen tournament, so second out of 16, he was brought back to compete again. But this time he was actually knocked out in the second round. And so he did worse the second time than he did the first time. And this kid, this 14-year-old kid's walking down that terrible hallway they always send you down on Chopped, and eventually he collapses in tears. And during his exit interview, he said that he would never cook again. And as much as I love watching cooking shows and as much as I enjoy the redemption episodes, sometimes they're hard to watch because these people so badly want to redeem themselves, enough to put them through the torture of Chopped again. But every time this happens, there are people who sought redemption who end up losing and three of the four go away worse than how they originally came in. Which, if you think about it, is a really crappy way to get redemption. 
Today, we're in week four of our series called Jesus Is, and each week we're reading a chapter out of the book of John, and we, we, we read a story from John's perspective about Jesus. John was somebody who was with Jesus, so it's his version of Jesus' life. And so we've seen through John 1, 2, and 3 that Jesus is full of grace and truth, that Jesus is impacted by our burdens, that Jesus is love, and today we're talking about how Jesus is the Redeemer, now, Redeemer is one of those words that we don't really use outside of church. Uh, in fact, it's one of those things that Christians like to throw around a lot, like, I'm redeemed and we're redeemers. And, and the reality is you're like, yeah, that's great. I don't know what that means, especially in context to Jesus. And so one of the things that we've said from the beginning is we're not that church. So we're not going to tell you redeemed and we're not going to say redemption without explaining what that means. And so redemption actually means to buy back. So when we say that Jesus is the Redeemer— what we are saying is that Jesus is the one buying back. And this is because we believe that our sin creates a debt that we cannot pay. And the price is too steep. So Jesus pays for that with his own life. He redeems us. He atones us for our mistakes. He rescues us from our circumstances. Outside of the church, think about coupons, right? And this is weird. Stick with me. When we redeem a coupon, it takes the place of the price that we would have to spend. It doesn't mean that the item is free. It still has a cost. It means that the coupon covers that cost. And that's what it means to be redeemed. And that's what redemption means. So let's jump into John 4. And we're going to see how Jesus is the Redeemer. And so up to this point, Jesus is gaining popularity. We've seen before, he's, he's teaching in radical ways. He's performing miracles. And so this crowd is starting to follow him. Now, the crowd is split. So some of the people in the crowd believe that he is the son of God. Some people are just kind of curious about him. And some people, to be honest, don't like him. And so, so Jesus is starting a movement and people are following him because of that. People are getting baptized and the world is beginning to change. But because of that, persecution is getting stronger. And so Jesus and his disciples decide they're going to leave where they are and they're going to head up to Galilee. And this is where John continues the story in John 4 starting in verse 3. So he, meaning Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now we're going to pause there for a second because this is incredibly, incredibly rich. Now this doesn't have anything to do with this idea of redemption, but we need to talk about this. So Jesus and his disciples are in a place called Judea, and they want to go to Galilee. And in order to go from Judea to Galilee, they have to go through a place called Samaria. And so think about it this way. Judea, Galilee, and Samaria are all kind of like counties. We actually have a map. Let's check out this map. And so you can see you've got Judea, Samaria, then Galilee. And so they're down at the bottom. They've got to make their way up to the top. That sea up there is actually the Sea of Galilee. And so John is actually telling us, hey, this is the way that they're going. And the reason why this matters is because we have to understand the context of that time. And so Jesus was Jewish. And Samaritans, and the people who lived in Samaria, and Jews hated each other. This dated back to the Old Testament when they actually used to be a part of one people group, but a kingdom split sent them into two different directions. And because of this split, there were racial and social tensions that were still felt during Jesus' time. Both Jewish and Samaritan religious leaders taught that it was wrong to have any contact with the opposite group. They also taught that neither was to enter each other's territories or even speak to somebody from that other region. So most Jews, if we can put the map back up there, when, when they were traveling and most Samaritans when they were traveling, what they would do is they would avoid the areas where the, where the Jewish people lived or where the Samaritans lived. They would actually walk all the way around. And so when John tells us they had to go through Samaria, what he's telling us is that Jesus didn't care about the social and racial tensions of that day. This is one of the reasons why the story of the Good Samaritan made such a large impact on the Jewish community when Jesus taught it. The Good Samaritan is a parable. We've heard that phrase before, right? The Good Samaritan. And it comes from the Bible. And it's a parable. It's an illustration that Jesus gives. And the story is about a man who's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he's attacked by robbers. They strip him of his clothes, beat him, and leave him half dead. Jesus continues the story that a priest and a Levite, who, which is really important, are both Jewish religious leaders, see the beaten man and walk to the other side of the street and walk past him. But then a Samaritan sees him and takes pity on him. 
And the Samaritan sees this Jewish man beaten, clinging to life, and he bandages his wounds and brings him to an inn and takes care of him. When Jesus tells this story, it's not just about caring for people. The story isn't just being uh, about being a good Samaritan. The story is not about not allowing racial and social and religious and regional tension stand in the way of taking care of people. So when John writes he had to go through Samaria, he isn't, ju- us, he isn't just telling us where Jesus went. He isn't just telling us that they chose the most direct route so we can think, Jesus is a good traveler. John is telling us that Jesus didn't care that they weren't socially supposed to interact with the Samaritans. And John is telling us that Jesus didn't care that there are people from a different tribe. And John is telling us that Jesus didn't avoid people because of the color of their skin or because another group thought they were bad. And although that doesn't have to do with redemption at all, I think it's really important that we just mention that because that's a point that Jesus made and it's a point that John made that was incredibly important that when Jesus was on his ministry, it didn't matter who it was, his ministry was for them. The story continues, John 4, 5 through 6. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So Jesus ends up at Jacob's well, and this is important. Jacob was a follower of God who is part of this promise that God made to essentially change the world forever. And so Jacob is an incredibly important person in our Christian faith. He was an important person in Jewish faith. And so what happens is Jesus is traveling through Samaria, and noon hits, and he ends up at Jacob's well. And again, this is something that we see from Jesus that is incredibly intentional. He ends up at the well at noon, noon being the hottest part of the day. Custom said that people would go to the wells early in the morning or late at night. But Jesus decides to go to the well in the middle of the day. This wasn't to avoid people so he could be alone. Rather, it was so he could bump into people who were trying to be avoided. Because the reality was the people who went to the well in the middle of the day were outcasts. They were people who had been pushed aside by their own culture because of their sin and because of their brokenness. And so when Jesus chooses to sit there, he does it intentionally. He does it knowing full well that someone's going to show up that needs to hear what he's about to offer. The story continues. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Skipping verse 8 because it's just about food and the disciples going to eat, not important. John 4, 9, this is what it says. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And and for us, we might read that and think that feels small. But this is very bold because it goes against social norms of the time. She recognizes from the start that Jesus should not be interacting with her. She's a Samaritan. She's a woman. And she's clearly an outcast because she's coming to the well in the middle of the day trying to avoid public. And Custom would have clearly told Jesus and the Samaritan woman that they needed to avoid each other. But Jesus doesn't care, and he continues in John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He says to this woman, If you only knew who I was, not only would you understand that I don't care that you're a Samaritan, that I don't care that you're an outcast, that I don't care that you're a woman, not only would you realize that I don't care because I don't put up those barriers, you would also realize the person that's asking you for water can offer you so much more. Jesus talks about this gift of living water. It's another way of saying new life. And he's telling this woman, if you only knew who I was, you'd realize that I'm not just talking about water, that I'm not here for tangible water, but for living water. Not water that quenches your human thirst for a while before being thirsty again. Living water that quenches what your soul longs for and does so forever. 
Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You can read there, as John tells it, that the Samaritan woman is clearly confused, which makes sense. (laughs) She was hoping to go to a well to avoid people. And here's this guy standing there talking about living water. And so for her, even though Jesus is talking about living water and he's actually talking about new life, she's still thinking about literal water. This is us. So often we focus all of our energy on the physical needs that we have. And we do that at the cost of our spiritual needs. We try so hard to be satisfied physically. And we miss the fact that we're spiritually broken. What Jesus is trying to do is get her to focus less on our physical needs and more on our spiritual needs. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Yeah, as they continue to have this interaction, you can realize, like, of course, eventually she's going to ask for that water that Jesus is offering. Even though she thinks it's literal water, if someone offered you water that you could drink one time and never be thirsty, you would take that offer. And so she's still a little bit confused. She still doesn't quite get it. And she still thinks Jesus is talking about the water that's in that well. And so Jesus makes the point the only way he can. He asks her a question. He asks her a question to bring up the brokenness in her own life. But why would Jesus do that? And the reason why he does it is he wants to point out her need for living water. He wants to point out her need to be made new. He wants to point out her need to be redeemed. One thing I actually love about the Samaritan woman in this story is that even when Jesus kind of calls her out, even though we might read that and feel like it's a little bit aggressive, she doesn't deny her past sin. She doesn't even deny her current sin. It's not that she's proud of it. It's just that she's not oblivious to the fact that she needs a Savior. She's not oblivious to the fact that her past isn't what she wanted it to be and her present where is, isn't where she wants to go. She recognizes that. She doesn't de- deny it. She doesn't fight it. She doesn't try to cover it up. And I love the fact that she doesn't get defensive when Jesus asks her about her husband. It's because she realizes that the life she is living isn't what God intended. And we see that in how she responds to Jesus when he asks that question. And we see that, how they continue to interact in John 4, starting in verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in the truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. In this interaction, the Samaritan woman recognizes the fact that Jesus just isn't a normal guy. She's slowly starting to pick up, well, he's not just some dude hanging out here to get some water, that there's something special about Jesus. And as she asks those questions, Jesus starts talking about prophecies, things from the Old Testament that were pointing to the fact that a Messiah was coming. And she recognizes those things. She actually acknowledges, I know that a Messiah is coming. I know that a Savior is coming. I know that there's a chosen one coming to redeem these people. And she recognizes that as she talks to Jesus. 
She's waiting for that Messiah. She's waiting for those prophecies to be true. And it makes sense. She's a Samaritan. She's someone who's been told her entire life that she's wrong. She's a woman who clearly in that society was not treated equally. She's someone who's been married five times and is living with a new man. She's an outcast. And she's longing for that Messiah to come so that she can be redeemed. And Jesus tells her, I am he. I am that Messiah. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. Jesus is the living water that we need. He is the redeemer that we long for. The story tells us it doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter the past sin in your life. And it doesn't matter your current situation. Jesus is in front of you letting you know, I am he. I am that Messiah. I can make you new. I can redeem you. I will buy you back from your past brokenness and your past sin. Jesus is the redeemer. He is able to make things new. And we believe this because Jesus said that he would die and raise from the dead three days later, and he did. John, who is writing this book, who is with Jesus, saw it happen. And John eventually was killed a brutal death because he refused to acknowledge that it might not have happened. John gave up his own life because he's saying, I saw this and I'm not going to deny it. And that's how we know that Jesus raised from the dead. And the thing is, Jesus promised that that would happen and it came true. So if Jesus promises that he will die and raise from the dead and he does it, why would we be skeptical about Jesus when he says that he can give us living water? Why would we be skeptical about Jesus when he says that he can make us new? Why would we be skeptical about Jesus when he says that he will redeem us? Jesus can redeem the doubts and insecurities that you feel every day. Jesus can redeem the anger and bitterness that impacts every decision that you make. Jesus can redeem your loveless marriage. Jesus can redeem your dysfunctional family. Jesus can redeem your addictions and set you free. Jesus can redeem your past. Jesus is capable of redeeming your present. And Jesus will redeem your future. This doesn't mean that everything will be perfect. Jesus never promises that. But he does promise hope and grace and life to the fullest. And he does promise that you don't have to redeem yourself. That you don't need to carry that shame from your brokenness because Jesus is wanting to make you new. Jesus will buy all that back for you if you let him. But like we talked about last week with Jesus' love, the reality is Jesus' desire is for us to spend eternity with him, but it's still up to us. It's still a decision that we have to make on our, own, on our own. It's up to us to accept that living water. It's up to us to make that decision, to follow him, to be baptized, to be redeemed. And here's one of the best parts about the fact that Jesus has a desire to redeem us. It isn't just about being made new and forgiveness of sins. That's, that's just a part of it. Redemption through Jesus also brings new hope and purpose a new identity. Let's continue reading this story. John 4, starting in verse 28. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. As soon as she hears that Jesus says, I am he, she drops the literal water that she thought she was longing for and she sprints back into the town. And she realizes that she has to tell everyone about this Messiah. Skipping ahead a little bit, John 4, starting in verse 39, this is what it says. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days, which is incredible on its own, because remember, these are Samaritans asking Jesus to stay in their town with them for two full days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. She was just a Samaritan. She was a woman. 
She had five husbands and was currently living with a man who wasn't her husband. And because of her, many of the Samaritans from that town believed. She wasn't just able to be redeemed by Jesus. She introduced that same redemption to her friends and her family. Redemption doesn't just impact our past sins. Redemption impacts our future purpose. And that's what Jesus wants for your life. When Ray and I lived in Ohio, uh, we met a guy named Josh Kayser. And when I first met Josh, he was finalizing his divorce after his college sweetheart decided that she didn't love him anymore. He had also just gotten his second DUI and had lost his license. Josh was in a terrible place, and God was not a part of his life. But he was at rock bottom, and a friend named Dave actually invited him to church, so he figured he would give it a shot. Not because he thought that God could fix anything, but he started coming around because he was lonely. Over the next few months, Josh and I got to spend a lot of time together because he couldn't drive and he lived within walking distance of our church office. And so he'd walk over every day. And so while he was sitting in the office, instead of distracting me, I put him to work. (laughs) I taught him how to edit video and do graphic design because I figured if he's going to be here, you might as well be useful. But this led to amazing conversations with Josh about God and faith, about the idea that the junk that he was going through didn't have to be his identity forever. But Josh was skeptical. Josh was also an engineer, and his inability to make sense of every aspect of Jesus, the Bible, and the church made it hard for him to believe. He wanted the most clear roadmap that you could find, and so he struggled. But Josh was giving it a shot. He was showing up on Sundays, and he was worshiping. He was connected to a community of people. He was even serving. And while he was doing this, he would tell you that he could feel a shift in his own life. One night, we were hanging out at Starbucks when I asked him what was stopping him from fully jumping in, from fully understanding that it's not physical water, but that it's spiritual water. And he told me that the reason why he couldn't commit to Jesus is because he wanted to be as perfect as he could be before making that decision. He was still working through an incredible amount of sin in his life. And he still had doubts. The struggle that Josh had is a lot like the ones that we have. We try to do everything we can to redeem ourselves. We try to work through our sin by ourselves. We try to give ourselves hope and ourselves purpose. But at some point, we have to be like the Samaritan woman. And we have to realize that redemption isn't something that comes from us, but from the Messiah. That we can take care of our our physical needs, but we need Jesus to take care of our spiritual needs. Jesus lived a perfect life so that he could redeem us. So we don't have to try to redeem ourselves and continually fall short. That night, I tried to encourage Josh that it wasn't about being perfect, that Jesus never asks us to come perfect. In fact, every opportunity that we see Jesus talking to people, it was very imperfect people who decided to follow him. And I explained that we don't have to have our life together in order to follow Jesus. We just have to realize that we can't redeem ourselves. But he still struggled. Eventually, Ray and I actually moved away uh, while Josh was still in Ohio. We moved to Tennessee. And we continued our conversations, but every time we talked, you could just hear the struggles. And he would ask questions, and you, and you can see that there's just something that was stopping him. And it was dis- his desire to redeem himself before approaching God. In the winter after we moved, it was about four months later, I got a call from Josh asking if we would drive up to be at his baptism. And when I asked him why he finally made the decision, he told me that it finally clicked, that his desire to be perfect negated his need for a savior. And after two incredibly long years of Josh trying to fix everything from his past and falling short and trying to be perfect in his present, he realized that that's what made God so good. Is that after two years of him trying to do it himself, he realized that's the point, that he can't. 
And if you're here today and you're someone who would say you're not a follower of Jesus or you struggle or you have doubts or you're skeptical, one, we're so glad you're here. This is the right place to be. But two, I want you to know that Jesus can be your redeemer. He wants to buy you back from the debt that your sin creates. The reality is the price is too steep for us to pay on our own. We try. We wish we could do it. But we don't have to because Jesus is willing to pay that price. If you're somebody who'd say you are a follower of Jesus, you understand what redemption looks like. Your own life is a story of that. My challenge to you is this. It doesn't stop there. Because just like the Samaritan woman who learned about living water, she didn't stay at the well. She realized she needed to go share that with other people. If you're a follower of Jesus, you call yourself a Christian. It's on us to share that redemption is possible. And it's on us to introduce that to people in our own lives. Because everybody needs redemption. Everybody needs it for their past. Everybody currently needs it for their present. And we'll definitely need it in the future. Let's pray. God, thank you that, that you buy us back. God, thank you that you love us so much that you think we're worthy of being bought back. That you would live a perfect life to die for us so that we could have hope and we could have grace and we could have eternity with you. God, thank you for stories like the Samaritan woman God, stories of people who are outcast, people who are broken, people who have sin all over themselves. But God, people who you use and who you love and people who you don't avoid and you spend time with. God, I I pray for redemption for all of us. You know we need it. So God, I just pray for those people who are struggling with that, who are struggling with their past, or, or, or have gotten to a point where they realize that they can't do enough to make it right, that God, they realize that you are the only way. And God, for people who feel like they get redemption every day from you, and people who love you because of that, God, I just pray that they do something with it. That redemption is a gift not to be kept here at the well, but to be brought to our city. We love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.